Well, greetings, everyone. We're on day three, Gospel Day. We're going to be looking at the gospel from both the Old Testament perspective and the New Testament perspective. In a way, it's fulfillment in the New Testament. So uh, open with me to Genesis chapter three. We're going to go through this chapter briefly, uh, draw out a few specific points, and then uh, conclude with the New Testament. So this, uh, this is taking place after the creation, and everything is perfect. At this point, there is no sin. Uh, every animal is in harmony, living uh, together with one another. So let's uh, let's pick up in verse one. It says, "Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made." And he said to the woman, "Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden?" The woman said to the serpent, "From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden." God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he's preying on her pride, on on her desire for even control, to know that which is not for her to know. Verse 6 says, it says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so it's appealing to her physically, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cover coverings. You see, at this point, yes, they were naked, but they had no idea about it. There wasn't anything uh, uh, inappropriate about it because sin or anything unpure had not entered the world. We need to wear clothes because to do, to do otherwise would be immodest. We would be thinking inappropriate thoughts about one another. And so in verse 8, we see uh, that the Lord now is pursuing them. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, Notice he calls to the man first and said to him, where are you? He, I mean Adam, said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, meaning God, said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, well, the woman whom you have gave to me, she gave me uh, from the tree, and, and I ate. See? There's this blame passing. It's, it's passing the book. Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Again, a blame game. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. But the, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So let's pause there for a second. So the enemy, Satan, in the form of the serpent, deceived both man and woman. Now, oftentimes we joke and we'll say, oh, well, it was the woman's fault, or oh, it was just the man's fault. But we see in here what is still taking place today. Woman had a desire for control, to know that, to have in control the knowledge that God did not want to give to her. It was not hers to have, but she wanted it. Man was passive. He was watching all this unfold, and he didn't stop it from taking place. He didn't step in. He did not take action. So both men and women showed these character traits that are still in force today. It doesn't mean that just men struggle with passivity or, or just women struggle with control. 
But a lot of the times these are seen in both those sexes and it began here at the fall of man. And so God calls to each of them, holding them accountable, and they each pass the buck, right? Man says, well, it was woman's fault who you gave to me. We don't want and we don't like to take responsibility for our own sin, our own actions. We oftentimes like to put the blame on other people, on circumstances, or on, on groups of people that, well, because of that, I chose to, to think or act or say this. Woman passed the buck on to, uh, to the serpent. And so we have to take accountability for our own sin, and we have to do that before calling out other people. We, we oftentimes love to call out others or groups of people. We even like to call out different sides of the political spectrum. We like to make postings uh, on social media. But before we do all that, we, we don't check ourselves first. There is a time, yes, to call out wrong. Absolutely. We have to first look at ourselves and be accountable for our actions, our thoughts, our words first. So God curses um, uh, the serpent. And he says they're going to put this enmity between you and the woman. And he gives a, a prophetic uh, a few words here where he says, He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is talking about one day uh, with the whole crucifixion and sacrifice of Christ um, and, and the serpent meaning the devil. The woman now has these repercussions for her actions, this pain that will take place uh, in childbirth. Uh, and that she will still be ruled by her husband. Now, what does this mean? Well, it's this idea of biblical uh, submission. It's not uh, necessarily what the flesh wants. But, and this is a, a topic that could be discussed in greater detail. But in, in the Bible, we see the biblical setup for a marriage is the man is the leader out of a servant's heart, not out of a domineering spirit. But oftentimes... Uh, a man and a woman struggle with this. Why? Because that woman still wants control and the man is still a passive leader and not leading out of strength and strength through a sacrificial spirit uh, laying his life down for his wife as he follows Christ and sees Christ's example for laying his life down for the church. We also see that uh, things have changed in the animal kingdom. Right, this this um, uh, loin coverings were made out of fig leaves, um, and but but even beyond that, it says, and that's because they finally found out that they were naked. But here's where the change in the animal kingdom comes. In verse 21, it says, "The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed him." These are from animal skins. You see, this is a foreshadowing, in a sense, of sacrifice. A sacrifice that would cover their nakedness came from uh, uh, animals here. The sacrifice that would cover our spiritual nakedness, our sins, would be made by the perfect sacrifice, which we'll get to in just a second, by the Lamb of God, Jesus. So now, because sin has entered the world, now death has entered the world. And this is the first uh, look of that, from the killing of these animals, to clothe Adam and Eve's physical nakedness. Man's curse is that he's going to have to now work continuously to provide. It's not just going to be given to him. The, the, the literal ground will be hard to, to till up, for instance, with farming. Uh, and that this, this physical death will ultimately take place. No longer will man live eternally, physically, but we see here that you will return to the dust. Now, we will live forever, spiritually speaking. And we're going to now turn to what does that look like? <clears throat> because, uh, and actually, let's conclude here in verse 22. It says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden, meaning Adam and Eve are now kicked out of the Garden. And this us is another picture of the Trinity. Uh, so they're out of the Garden of Eden. 
uh, to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden, he st stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Uh, we, we don't, uh, we've never been able to get into that Garden of Eden. It's unknown exactly what happened to it. But that is what we were supposed to be. We're supposed to be living in that perfection, which one day we will in heaven. But now Adam and Eve are sent out of that perfect, harmonious Garden of Eden because of their sinful decision. The fall of man took place there and is as carried into every generation since. And again, remember, uh, the animals were killed in that garden to cover physically their nakedness. And now we're going to get to what that looks like, spiritually speaking. So fast forward all these years into the New Testament. Jesus comes, the Christmas story, in order to give us spiritual life. When that sin took place, there now was a spiritual separation between mankind and God. There has to be a judgment paid for sin, just like there's a judgment paid for wrong actions here on earth. There had to be something, and that could only be through blood. And so God sent his son, as many of you are familiar with, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, spiritually speaking, but have eternal life. We will all perish physically. But if we believe in Jesus Christ, we will not perish spiritually. Jesus died and rose again, the Easter story, for my sin, for your sin. What is sin? Well, it's messing up. It's doing things we should not do, whether intentionally or unintentionally. You know, just think about it. Does a child have to be taught to disobey? Of course not. It's that sinful nature that has carried on since the fall of man. As soon as a child is conceived in the womb, they are, they're not innocent. They, they, they appear innocent, right? They're, they're cute. They're beautiful. They're, they're miracles. They're God's handiwork. But because of that fall, they are still a sinful, fallen human being in need of God's grace. You see, if you and I do not accept Jesus, we go to hell. If we do, we go to heaven. As a baby, die and go to hell? Well, no, they have not reached that age to where they can make a choice between Jesus or themselves. We look at even in the Old Testament when David's child died, there's this portion there that talks about, and David says, he cannot come back to me, but one day I will go to him. It's this image and it's this depiction of one day them being reunited in heaven. And so from there we can we can gather that babies do indeed go to heaven out of God's grace and his mercy and love. In Romans 10, verse 9, Paul says, And if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is the gospel. What does that term gospel mean? It means good news. In fact, it's the best news of all time. There's not uh, a specific action we have to do as far as earning it. There's nothing we can do to earn it. The Bible is clear. All you have to do is confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the one and only way to heaven. You, you confess your sins. You ask him for forgiveness of your sins, and you ask him into your life. You see, there's a two-part thing I want to conclude with, is that if you do not know Jesus and you're listening to this, would today be the day? Would today be the day that you give your life to him? He wants to cover up all of your wrongdoings. We all have wrongdoings. And there's nothing that you've done that can be too great of a sin that he can't cover. He can forgive anything, and he wants to have a relationship with you to take you on a journey unlike any other, to give you peace and hope, a purpose and a plan, and love, a perfect kind of love. If you, if you are a Christian, sometimes it can be easy for us to forget that this is our command that we tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ, that we tell of the story of mankind's fall based on sin, but we tell of the grace offered through Jesus Christ. So would you commit this verse to memory, Romans 10, 9? Would you recommit yourself to telling any and everyone about the good news, the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. See who you know that doesn't know Jesus. See how you can talk with them to love them and love them regardless of their choice, whether or not to accept Jesus, that you love them with a genuine love because you have received the love of Jesus Christ. And again, if you don't know him, would today be the day that you just call out to him that you believe that Jesus died and rose for your sins and you accept him as your Lord and Savior. Now he's the one you're following. If you are a Christian or if you just become a Christian, get into God's word. Join us here at town, uh, whether physically or online on our Facebook page or wherever you're listening to this. Get plugged into a Bible believing church. And Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you wherever you go. And that's not dependent upon if you go to church or if you pray. It's, not, it's dependent upon him. He never fails. But he desires and he commands for us to, to once we receive Jesus and then to get into his word, to fellowship with him in prayer and to get involved in a local church. Joining Jesus will be the best decision of your life. Take care.